I've been meaning to do videos in this vein for a very, very long time. Basically, since this channel in its current form was launched. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you're experiencing my history vlogs in their final form. The Croatians of this generation seem to be blissfully oblivious and blasé about their history. Like, everything before the 90s is completely irrelevant when it isn't. But... If you're coming here and you have no prior experience with me, me before, you're probably puzzled about this title, Iranian Legacy, Croatia. So listen the fuck up. While the Croatians are Slavs, they are and have always been Slavs, the Croats were an ancient Sarmatian tribe from the Northern Caucasus. Full stop. Grab your popcorn, your coke, your coffee, or whatever, because for the next hour, we'll be exploring the Iranian Sarmatians and their role in Croatian history. Or you can just select the timestamps of your choice in the description below. Come one, come all, because we're talking about Croatia. This is the first serious video ever uploaded in my channel's history where I'll be speaking to you without a script the whole way through so if you see me if you detect me speaking slower than you're usually accustomed to me speaking that's why so this is it the real me spontaneously speaking to you about history genetics and culture that's Iranian in origin well, actually, I should clarify that that opening introduction was using a script, actually. But from this point onwards, I'll be speaking spontaneously without a script. So, here we go. So, I've already established right off the bat that the Croatians are a Slavic people and nothing else. But you know, Slavic has actually just been a catch-all term used to refer to a wide variety of indigenous European farmers united only in language, and it only really becomes a bona fide nationality in the 19th century and 20th century. But when we're speaking about this in the context of the Balkans, the Slavs are not a race. In fact, they're a combination of several. And even when Slavic becomes a bona fide nationality and Slavism becomes a bona fide political movement, there are still a bunch of other competing political and national ideologies and people in the Balkans being told that they're something else other than Slavic. And not even in the 19th or 20th century, but before those eras as well. But we'll get to that, don't worry. In fact, when you have the time, there's a book that I highly, highly recommend that you go read and take a look at. It's a book that I'm going to be referencing here a lot in this episode. It's called Bosnia Short History by Noel Malcolm. Noel Malcolm is a Cambridge-educated historian and academic. In this book, Noel Malcolm basically makes a very persuasive argument the whole way through on how it's been foreigners that have been dictating the usage of the term Slavic to refer to the ethnic and national identity of the Croatians, even as recently as the 20th century. They didn't consider themselves that before. This is something that begins to change around the mid-19th century, but even then, it's being contested. In some instances, they've LARPed as non-Slavs for political reasons, 
like, for example, during the Second World War. But in general, they've been very flaky and inconsistent when it comes to embracing Slavdom. Especially when it comes down to associating themselves with the Serbs. Navanko Bartulin makes similar arguments in his scholarly work, too, entitled The Racial Idea and the Independency of Croatia, Origins and Theory, which I will also be citing a lot in this episode. I mean, you have a bunch of Croat pan-Slavists, but you also have a lot of pan-Slavist Croats also claiming that they're Illyrians and that they're Aryans? Where's the consistency? Where's the ideological congruence? In relation to language and culture, the South Slavs have always been, like, loosely and tenuously united. But the arrival of the Slavs into the Balkans isn't, like, the starting point of Croatian, Serbian, and Bosnian history, or of Slovenian history. Very little attention is paid to the Illyrians, who were there before them, or to the Goths, or to the Alans, or to the Sarmatians, or even to the Turkic Avars. Like, for example, there were nativist indigenous Croatian authors like Ivo Pilar, who wrote that the Croats are part of the Nordic Aryan racial and cultural heritage, and the Serbs are mixed with Balkan Romanic flocks. Oh yeah, and by the way, these thinkers who were Croatians ethnically were well aware that the Aryans are the people of Iran and India. There's also this doctoral dissertation by another ethnic Croatian called Josef Blumenthal, dating back to 1797. 1797. What was the motivation? The thesis of his dissertation was the Croats are a Slavic people originating from the Sarmatians descending from the Medes. He was actually being serious and even defended this doctoral dissertation of his in the Zagreb Royal Academy back in 1797. This was before genetics, archaeology, and comparative linguistics even existed. And this notion of the Croatians having some historical ancestry from Iran begins to receive a lot of significant attention and investigation by ethnic Croatians, by ethnically Croatian scientists during the period of communist Yugoslavia by scientists and historians like Sakac, Katicic, and Mandic, and I'll be talking about them and everything that they said in that time period. Even Ante Starcevic, who is commonly cited as the father of Croatian nationalism, he even admitted that the Croats are mixed with barbarians. By barbarians, he means people like the Goths and the Alans and the Sarmatians. We'll get to all of that later on. But first, we need to talk about the indigenous people of modern-day Croatia. Most of the Balkans have always been kind of poorly settled due to its mountains and thick forests. The cities and towns that did exist were either by major inland routes or the sea. The towns below this line were largely Greek, whereas the towns above it had more mixed population. For example, the towns near the sea were very much Latin as opposed to the towns which were more inland. These probably still spoke Latin as it was the main trading language in the area, but they were mostly made up of Illyrian, Thracian, Dacian, and the remnants of some Germanic tribes. 
troops. However, when the area came under the control of the Byzantines, even the northern cities started to get more Hellenized. Now that we covered the cities, let's look at the countryside. What little of it was populated was mostly either by the descendants of retired Roman soldiers, which oftentimes at the end of their service were given land in the Balkan region, and or Illyrians, Thracians, Dacians, Greeks, and again some remnants of Germanic tribes. And even though this may seem like a lot of people, numbers wise it truly wasn't. There was also no clear predominant division between these farming settlements. It would be completely common to find valley with Illyrian farmers next to a valley of Germanic farmers next to two more valleys that were not settled. The genesis of the South Slavs actually begins over a thousand years ago, but before the migration from the core of the Slavic homeland, there were many other Indo-European groups living in this region, including the Thracians in the southeast, Illyrians on the western coast, who may or may not have evolved into the modern-day Albanians, but that line of thinking is more popular in the nation of Albania rather than in the Slavic nations, many of whom also sort of think of themselves as the successors of the Illyrians. But definitely two of the biggest players in the Balkans 2,000 years ago were the Latin and Greek peoples, as the Roman province of Dalmatia, located in the eastern Balkans, was one of the most heavily Latinized areas in the Roman Empire. Around the 6th century AD, during the migration period of Europe when Germanic tribes and others were moving around the continent, another group of quote-unquote barbarians that entered the Roman Empire came from the Slavic homeland in modern Ukraine. These Slavs, along with the Goths, settled in the European half of the Byzantine Empire, and in only a couple short centuries, the formerly Latin-speaking province of Dalmatia had been replaced by Slavic peoples, or at least assimilated into the new Slavic culture, although a very small subsection of the Dalmatians survived and live on today as the Istriots, located in the Istrian Peninsula in modern Croatia. So as Massimon pointed out with his brilliant Wikipedia plagiarism, Dalmatia was a heavily Latinized province of the Roman Empire. The same is the case for Illyria. And part of that heavy Latinization involves the Aaronic pagan Mithraic cult, which was brought into both Dalmatia and probably Illyria through the Roman legionaries who were stationed there because they were the practitioners of it. These aren't all derived from one Proto-Indo-European source. Rather, the, this god comes through the indo iranic peoples and then comes into Europe and is adopted and then changes later. Um, there isn't a, a European one of that antiquity. So the ones we have of the greatest antiquity is Mitra, which is uh, attested in Iranian history, uh, and also who's related to the the, hint, the Sanskrit as well uh, version as well, Mithra. Most people, though, when they think of Mithras, they think of the Roman religion of Mithras, and that actually is derived from the Persian one, not from the Proto-Indo-European one. So the Persian cult came via Greece back into uh, into Europe, and it changed. So the religion, the original meaning of Mitra in uh, Indo-Iranic language or Proto-Indo-Iranic from which the Persian language of Western and Sanskrit, the language of Hinduism, are both derived, it kind of means pact or contract. But the deity himself is quite distinct. The, the way that he was worshipped in Iran and India is distinct and then when he comes into Rome it becomes again something quite distinct. The Mithraic cult in Rome became a military cult and the, the Mithraic mysteries as they're called were quite distinct from Roman religion in general. Only men could follow this religion and almost entirely military. It was mostly soldiers who followed it. They actually found the archaeological remnants of a Mithraeum in or not in, but rather around the outskirts of the Dalmatian city of Mochichi and in the modern-day Bosnian city of Yese and also in the Konjic region, which is also inside Bosnia now. Now, we actually don't have too much information about the Illyrians, like, for example, we don't even know what their religion was or what their societal structure was like. But we do have confirmation that Mitraism was 
big here. However, Noel Malcolm's impressive scholarship sheds a lot of light on this matter. From Bosnia, a short history, pages 2 to 4. The earliest inhabitants of whom we have any historical details are the Illyrians, a collection of tribes which covered much of modern Yugoslavia and Albania and spoke an Indo-European language related to modern Albanian. The tribe which gave its name to Dalmatia, the Delmate, was probably named after a word related to the Albanian word for sheep, Delne. Its territory covered part of western Bosnia, and the archaeological evidence from several sites in Bosnia shows that the Illyrian tribes were stock breeders specializing in sheep, pigs, and goats. Other tribes encountered by the Romans as they extended their power inland in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC included a mixed Illyrian Celtic grouping, the Scordisi, on the northeast fringe of Bosnia, and a warlike tribe in central Bosnia, the De Citatis, whose last rebellion against the Roman Empire was finally crushed in 9 AD. From then on, all the Illyrian lands were firmly under Roman rule, and a network of roads and Roman settlements was gradually established. Several roads ran across Bosnia from the coastal towns of Salona near Split. These were needed not so much for trade as for military operations further to the east, but they also served as delivery routes for the gold, silver, and lead which were mined in eastern Bosnia in Roman times. The use of Latin must have become widespread in Roman Bosnia. It was the only common language for the settlers from many parts of the empire who came to live in the province of Dalmatia from Italy above all, but also from Africa, Spain, Gaul, Germany, Greece, Asia Minor, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. Most of these colonists lived in the coastal towns, but there are records of people with Asian names in the Neretva Valley, western Herzegovina, and in the Yese region of northwestern Bosnia. From the mid-2nd century AD onwards, large numbers of military veterans were also settled as colonists in the Balkans. A telling sign of their importance is the fact that in Romanian, the language which developed out of the Latin spoken in this region, the word for old man, batin, is derived from veteranus. The Illyrians themselves were heavily recruited into the Roman legions, and from the late 2nd century onwards, the Illyrian lands were the military power base for a number of provincial governors and generals who became Roman emperors. The first of these, Septimius Severus, dismissed the Praetorian Guard when he came to Rome in 193 and replaced it with Illyrian troops. A throng, in the words of one Roman historian, of motley soldiers most savage in appearance, most terrifying in speech, and most boorish in conversation. Now, the Slavs change all of this. They take over as the demographic majority in this region even before the Serbs and the Croats arrived, and Slavic becomes the new common language of this region. But let's just continue. Other Roman and Greek sources take a similarly superior attitude towards these provincial Balkan tribesmen. As a result, we have no really detailed accounts of their social structure, their religion, or their way of life. But one passing comment by the Greek geographer Strabo is particularly intriguing. He mentions that tattooing was common among the Illyrians. His testimony has been confirmed by a discovery of tattooing needles in Illyrian burial mounds in Bosnia. Tattooing is not known to have been a Slav custom at any time or in any part of the Slav realms, and yet it has survived well into this century among the Catholics of central Bosnia and the Muslims and Catholics of northern Albania. In the 1920s, the English traveler and... Balkan scholar Eddie Dorham made a detailed study of the practice and copied many of the Bosnian designs. Simple geometric patterns of circles, crosses, and crescents apparently representing raid suns and moons. Women, she reported, are far more elaborately tattooed than men. Their arms and forearms are often covered with patterns. The friendly ones said they tattooed because it is our custom, because we are Catholics, because it is pretty, and said my hands would be prettier tattooed. 
This practice is striking evidence of cultural continuity in Bosnia, stretching all the way back to the Illyrian tribes. Unfortunately, it is the only strong piece of evidence. Claims about Illyrian origins have been made about other apparently non-Slav practices which survive in Bosnia, such as polyphonic folk music, but there the corroboration of Roman or Greek writers is lacking. So that's one strong piece of evidence in which the Slavicness of the Balkan Slavs can be contested, but there's way more than that. Pan-Slavs in the Balkans have historically used an Illyrian or a Gothic identity to unite each other historically. Then you have the Avars and the Alans. The Alans were Iranian ethnically, but they're not supposed to be terribly relevant because they just came as raiders, briefly settled in the region, and then got kicked out, right? Well, Noel Malcolm's Bosnia Short History, page 6. The Goths were not the only race to have visited the Western Balkans and perhaps left some descendants there between the Romans and the Slavs. Asiatic Huns, a Mongol Turkic people, and Iranian Alans, ancestors of the modern Ossetians and the Caucasus, also appeared in the 4th and 5th centuries. In the 6th century, two new populations entered the Balkans, the Avars, a Turkic tribe who came from the region north of the Caucasus, and the Slavs. Their histories were at first closely intertwined, either as allies or as rivals. The Avars, though less numerous, seem to have had the upper hand in this relationship because of their superior military skills. These Turkic tribesmen were eventually driven out of the Balkans in the early 7th century by Byzantine, Croat, and Bulgarian armies. Historians traditionally assumed that the Avars were a rather ephemeral presence in the region, essentially a military force interested only in raiding. However, modern research in archaeology and the study of many place names suggests that there were long-term settlements of Avars in many parts of western Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Montenegro, and some places including areas just to the north and northwest of Bosnia. Distinct groups of Avar settlers may have lingered for generations. The Slav name for the Avars was Obri, and there are many place names such as Obrovas, which record their presence. It is also possible that the word Bon, which from early times was used as the title of Croatian rulers, is itself of Avar origin. The mainstream narrative is that the Croatians and the Bosniaks LARPed as Goths during the Second World War when the Ustashi were in power for two main reasons. The first one being that they wanted to disassociate themselves from the Serbs, and the second one being that they wanted to obtain ethnic and racial equality as clients of the Nazis. The problem? This Gothic theory doesn't originate from the Second World War. It wasn't manufactured out of thin air for political reasons. It actually originates from a medieval manuscript written in Latin entitled The Chronicle of the Priest of Dioclea, otherwise known as Libellus Gotharum. Noel Malcolm's Bosnia Short History, pages 4 to 6. Sometimes it seems as if no population could enter the Balkans without giving rise to some similar theory for later generations to seize on. This is especially true of the next invaders, the Germanic tribes of Goths, who began raiding the Roman Balkans in the 3rd century, inflicted massive defeats on Roman armies in the late 4th century, conquered the fortress of Singidunum, modern Belgrade, in the late 5th century, but mainly withdrew to the kingdom which they established in Italy and Dalmatia soon thereafter. They were finally driven out of the Balkans, driven out 
of the Balkans by the Emperor Justinian in the early 6th century. After Justinian's campaigns, Bosnia became notionally, at least, part of the Byzantine Empire. Originally, it had been on the western side of the dividing line between the West Roman and East Roman lands. Any Goths who remained behind were quickly absorbed into the local population. Although they were settlers as well as raiders, the Goths seem to have left no cultural imprint on the Balkan lands. There is, for example, not a single word in any Balkan language that can be shown to be derived from Gothic. And yet a curious mythology later developed in which the Goths were seen as the true ancestors of the Croats and or the Bosnians. The origin of this myth was a medieval manuscript in Latin, the Chronicle of the Priest of Dioclea which seems to have incorporated an earlier Slav chronicle known by its Latin title as Libellus Gotharum, the Book of the Goths. It begins with the migration of the Goths into Pannonia and treats them as the original ancestors of the Slavs. The chronicle was used by several late Renaissance historians in Ragusa, Dubrovnik. The greatest of these, the Benedictine monk Mauro Orbini, constructed a grandiose theory of racial history in which nearly all the races which did anything interesting in the late classical and early medieval periods were Slavs, including Vandals, Avars, Normans, Finns, Thracians, and Illyrians, and all Slavs were Goths. All of these belonged to the same Slav nation and spoke the same Slav language. And when, at first, they left their common homeland, Scandinavia, they were all, except the Illyrians and Thracians, called by the single name of Goths. In Orbini's work, this identification with the Goths functioned as part of a kind of pan-Slav ideology in which the Goth Slavs were shown to have been the most active and powerful race in European history. But in some later versions of the, of the Gothic theory, People from the Western Balkans identified themselves as Goths in order to distinguish themselves from the Slavs. For obvious reasons, this theory became especially popular in Bosnia during the Second World War, when the Bosnians who wanted their autonomy, who wanted their country to be given autonomy from the Croatian fascist state, tried to establish their Bosnian identity on a separate racial basis. In 1942, a group of Bosnian Muslim autonomists sent a memorandum to Hitler in which they claimed racial superiority over their Slav neighbors. By race and blood, we are not Slavs. We are of Gothic origin. We Bosnians came down to the Balkans. We Bosnians came south to the Balkans in the 3rd century as a Germanic tribe. Even Hitler, it seems, found this theory a little hard to believe. Noel Malcolm uses the term Goth Slav here because it has more historical weight. This is the pre-Slavic history of Croatia in a nutshell, and fuck every pseudo-historian who overlooks it and ignores it. Next! Eighteen fifty three was the historiographical and political equivalent of a head on collision for Slavism in the Balkans. Two public inscriptions were discovered within close proximity of the city of Rostov on Don inside modern day Russia in the northern Caucasus. Something by the name of the Tanais tablets. Two tablets discovered in the archaeological remains of a formerly Hellenist or Hellenistic uh, city in the Northern Caucasus with a mixed uh, Greek, uh, Gothic, Cimmerian, and Sarmatian population written in Greek. There are three men mentioned in these tablets. Choruatos, Choruatos, and Choruatos. Choruatos in the second tablet, or tablet B, is referred to as the son of Sandaz. Sandaz 
was a Scytho Sarmatian ruler of that time period. Choroatos is Atacroat, the father of the Croats. This has led scholarship to conclude that the early Croats were actually a two way mix between the Goths who were living in the Crimea region at the time and a mixed collection of Alanic tribes. Both of them got Slavicized in the following centuries and from this, we can conclude that the Proto-Croatian homeland was here in the Northern Caucasus in the city of Tanais. Proving that Blumenthal's 1797 dissertation was actually correct. The first tablet is a bit flaky because it hasn't been fully reconstructed yet and it's also suffered quite a bit of damage but the second one is fully intact and we've been able to trace it all the way back to 220 AD that's when it was written but these tablets are generally dated to around the late second to the third century AD full stop Noel Malcolm of Bosnia, Short History, pages 7 to 8. Who exactly were the Serbs and the Croats? Scholars have long been aware that the name Croat is not a Slav word. It is thought to be the same as an Iranian name, Khoratos, found in inscriptions on tombstones near the Greek town of Tanais on the Lower Don in southern Russia. The whole region north of the Black Sea was inhabited in the early centuries AD by a, a mixture of tribes which included Slavs and Sarmatians. The latter were Iranian nomads who had passed westwards round the northern side of the Caucasus in the second century BC. The Sarmatians gained political dominance over the other tribes and it seems likely that some of the Slav tribes thus acquired an Iranian speaking ruling elite. One theory connects Khravat and Khoroatos with the word Khuruvata, which meant friend in the language of the Alans, who were part of the Sarmatian grouping of Iranian tribes at this time. Another theory proposes that the root of the name Serb, Serv, became Khav in Iranian, and that together with the suffix At, this gave rise to Khoroatos and Khravat. What is clear is that the Serbs and the Croats had a similar and connected history from the earliest times. Ptolemy, writing in the 2nd century AD, also located the Serboi among the Sarmatian tribes north of the Caucasus. Most scholars believe either that both Serbs and Croats were Slavic tribes with Iranian ruling castes, or that they were originally Iranian tribes which had acquired Slavic subjects. By the early 7th century, both tribes had established kingdoms in Central Europe, White Croatia, which covered part of modern southern Poland, and White Serbia and modern Czech lands. It was from there that they came down to the Western Balkans. Once again, modern ideology has had its way with ancient history. There have been Croat nationalist theorists who have selectively accepted the evidence of Iranian ancestry for their own people and rejected it for Serbs, thus creating an age-old racial divide between the two populations. This theory was also popular during the Second World War, when ancient Iranians stood higher in the Nazi racial hierarchy than mere Slavs. On the other hand, there have been self-Slav or pan-Slav ideologists who have rejected, for their own political reasons, all the evidence of early Iranian connections. But the historical truth is fairly clear. The Serbs and the Croats were, from the earliest times, distinct but closely connected, living and migrating in tandem, and both having some kind of Iranian component. What is also clear is that by the time they came to the Balkans, there was already a large Slav population in place, larger than the population of the Serbs and the Croats. That major substratum of Slavs it cannot be divided up into separate sub-ethnic groups. 
So the whole project of inventing ancient ethnic divisions among their descendants is necessarily a feudal one. And that Slav substratum itself must have absorbed the remnants of a population whose ancestors may originally have been Illyrians, Celts, Romans, individuals from all parts of the Roman Empire, Goths, Alans, Huns, and Avars. Here you have it, a professional Cambridge-educated academic and historian telling you that the Serbs and the Croats are Slavs with Iranian underpinnings. Deal with it, bitch. That's why Cambridge is the greatest university on the planet. Want to hear from some Croatian sources? This excerpt is talking about the Behistun inscription of Darius the Great, where there's a province inside modern-day Afghanistan called Kharalti-oi or Haralaiti, which is being speculated, which has been speculated as being the precursor to the name of Croatia and of the Croatian ethnonym. This is from Goth of Aruch's website. After an earlier Persian citation of the Croat society by Dvornik, there is another ancient mention of the Chorovatos on two stone inscriptions written in the Greek language and script. This is dated to approximately the year 200 CE, housed in the St. Petersburg Archaeological Museum. Source, Croatian history. This was discovered at the Black Sea region in the ancient seaport of Tanais on the Sea of Azov in the Crimea. Further... The Roman leader Amanius Marcellinus mentioned that two cities arose in ancient Persia called Chabroatis and Choratis. In this regard, Professor Mandich writes, Professor Mandich is Croatian, by the way, the Croats of the dawn then had to come in ancient times from Iran. On the stone inscription of the King Darius, the nation of the Kharovatis appears among the 23 subject nations. The Persian sacred books of the Avesti, Vendadad, call that nation the Kharavaiti. The provinces settled by that nation encompassed in those times the southern half of modern South Afghanistan, the whole of Baluchistan, and the eastern part of modern Iran. In that ancient province ought we to look for the Paleo Fatherland of the modern Croats. Mandich, 1970, Chapter 1. These Kharauti, Kharauti people are referred to as ethnic Pactions. Alexander the Great changes Kharauti's name to Arachosia after he conquers the territory, and Arachosia is literally just the Greek version of Kharawati or Kharavaiti and the Kharawati or Kharavaiti people morphed into the Alakuzai Pashtun tribe in Afghanistan. This conclusion made by Mandich is false because there is no Iranian farmer ancestry in the Croatians or in the Serbs. The people of the Kharawati province of Achaemenid Persia were Iranian farmers derived from the Bimak horizon. The name of this province inside Achaemenid Persia is actually purely coincidental and comparable to equating Caucasian Albania, what the modern day country of Azerbaijan used to be called by the Romans, with the contemporary country of Albania. Two unrelated but similar sounding places. The Northern Caucasus still holds water as the original homeland of the Serbs and the Croats. In this period of time, the city region of Tanais was under the dominion of the Bas foreign kingdom, which was a Hellenistic state ruled by a Sarmatian ruling class. The usage of the word Iranian here is a bit of a misnomer, because you see, the Sarmatians were only Iranian in relation to the language that they spoke. The same goes for the Scythians, and also 
even the Alans, who were BMACized. Just remember this for the rest of the duration of this episode. The Scythians and Sarmatians were non BMACized Uranics. The Alans were. When we hear the word Iranian or Sarmatian used to, to refer to the early Croats or the Proto Croats, we may very well actually be referring to Sarmatians, in quotations, who are actually ethnically and genetically Gothic in origin, but just speak the Sarmatian language. Or the Scythian language, because the most common languages of the Bosporan Kingdom were Scythian and Greek. There's no mention of Gothic. This was most likely the case, given the archaeological and genetic data and evidence that we have. From Croatia, Land, People, Culture, Volume 1, by Francis H. Eterovich and Christopher Splatletin. Chapter 3 As late as the 13th century, the Croatian nobility seems to have been conscious of its non-Slavic origin. Unfortunately, the surviving records of this caste provide no clues to the solution of the mystery of the Croatian ethnic identity. The earliest evidence of the presence of Croatians in Europe is the mention of their name in the Greek form Choratos and in inscriptions carved on tombstones near the site of the Greek colony of Tanais in southern Russia. These sepulchral inscriptions date from the 2nd or 3rd century AD. Most scholars ascribe them to Iranian Persian elements who for many centuries dominated the steppes of southern Russia. Undoubtedly, the Scythians and Sarmatians, who succeeded one another as masters of the steppe land, both included in their ranks a melange of Iranian frontier elements. Inevitably, the Sarmatians in particular must have exerted great influence over the Slavic peoples who lived between the Don and the Danube rivers, for they achieved political dominance over them. Even genuinely Slavic tribes were subjected to Iranian ruling castes. The late Romanian historian Dr. Nikolai Yorga is only one of a number of competent scholars who believe that the Slavs made their first appearance in history as members of the Sarmatian Confederation. Professors Francis Dvornik and Nikola Zupancic think that the, Eurasian, that the original Croatians were an Iranian Sarmatian people rather than a Slavic people. On the other hand, there is an increasing tendency to credit the Tanais inscriptions to still another Iranian Caucasian group, the Alans. This tribe appeared on the Black Sea littoral in the first century of the Christian era, settled around Tanais, and remained in this area for three full centuries. In their own language, the Croatians call themselves Hravati. There seems to be an etymological connection between this term and the Alan word for friend, Horovata. On the shores of the Black Sea, the Alans absorbed two Sarmatian peoples, the Sirasi and Iorsi. Many Alans, too, affiliated themselves with the Gothic nation, which, in the 3rd century AD, replaced the Sarmatians as the masters of southern Russia. The names Safrach and Andag, which appear in the Gothic Annals, are clearly Alanic. Also, the Goths undoubtedly, undoubtedly absorbed both Sarmatian and Slavic groups during their two centuries of rule over the steppe land. Often, the Romans themselves did not know whether the peoples living west of the Vistula were Gothic or Sarmatian. To the east of the Goths and the Lons in the basins of the Don and Donets rivers, there lived a confederation of tribes which bore the name Antes. They were a ruling warrior caste of Iranian Caucasian origin who had subjugated a larger mass of Slavic farmers, hence they were usually thought to be Slavs themselves. Antes, Goths, and Lons all yielded to the advance of the Huns around about uh, 375 AD. For some time, the Antis, along with the Ostrogoths, 
East Goths, and Alonic elements associated with the latter remained subject to the Huns. In the 5th century, the Ante Empire was revived, and Croatian tribes were known to the west of the Ante Confederacy. There is reason to believe that these Croatians represented an amalgam of Iranian stocks who were or had been ruled by the Ostrogoths, but who had become Slavicized through association and intermarriage with Slavic elements which had survived the Hunnish Holocaust. There must also have been intermarriage between the Croatians and the Antes. Meanwhile, the Visigoths or West Goths, accompanied by a large Alonic contingent, had fled across the Danube to escape the Huns between 376 and 378 AD. At the beginning of the 5th century, a mixed Visigothic Alonic horde under Radagas and Alaric descended upon Italy and those territories that are today known as Croatian. Other such inroads occurred in 406, 459, 471, and 489. This last indicated invasion resulted in the establishment of an Ostrogothic kingdom that included Italy, Dalmatia, Bosnia, Slavonia, Istria, and what is today known as Upper Croatia. In fact, from about 454 AD until the middle of the following century, the Ostrogoths claimed rule over all lands south of the Danube and eastward of the confluence of that river with the Sava. The bulk of their Visigothic king, uh, kinsmen had moved westward by this time into Gaul and Iberia, modern France and Spain. Their... The Iranian and the Gothic theories of the Croatian origins depend upon the assumption that considerable numbers of Goths, Alans, and other Iranian stocks included in the Gothic Horde remained in the lands that were destined to become Croatian. In a war that lasted from 534 to 553, the Byzantines overthrew the Ostrogothic kingdom, and the Ostrogoths went over the mountains, as contemporary chroniclers put it, and disappeared from the pages of history. Oh yeah, and by the way, the archaeologist who discovered these tablets to begin with was ethnically Russian. His name was Pavel Mikhailovich Leontiev. So yeah, I guess the Slavs themselves are the own saboteurs of their political ideologies. Totally. Pan-Slavism is a joke. Next. Much is made of the early civilizations of southeastern Europe and of its autochthonous people. The Greeks, the Illyrians, the Thracians, the Dacians. But what few acknowledge today is that these southeastern autochthonous European tribes weren't actually, well, you know, autochthonous. They originally were the descendants of Anatolian and Zagrosian farmers. These Anatolian Zagrosian farmers form the genetic basis behind the contemporary Mediterranean people of Southern Europe. The problem, in order to actually count as being ethnically, genetically Indo-Iranian, you need to have ancestry from the BMAC horizon. You need to have BMAC ancestry. That is to say, you need to descend partially, mainly, or even only from the native inhabitants of the BMAC horizon, the same part of South Central Asia where these Kharawati, Kharavaiti people, this subset of ethnic Pactians, were living in, according to the Behistun inscription. The, the ancient Iranians were not a Mediterranean people. 
The ancient Iranians formed a unique group of people in their own cluster known as the Caucasus Iran cluster. So the ancient Iranians were a unique form of people unto themselves and they were not Mediterranean Europeans or Nordic Europeans. The Mediterranean or Europeans were the ancient Greeks, the lower classes of the ancient Greeks as well as the lower classes of the ancient Romans. And recent uh, analysis from uh, Rome has shown that there was a sudden and quick transformation of of the ancient Roman genome. So the original ancient Romans were like southern Spaniards, sorry not southern Spaniards but Spaniards in general but after the shift they became more Levantine like and more Middle Eastern and this was major, this is something major to keep into account. Anyways, the Iranians uh, formed their own cluster and most of the Iranian ancestry was derived from the Neolithic Iranian farmers and this distinctified them from the uh, from the uh, Mediterraneans who were mostly Anatolian farmer derived. The Anatolian farmer ancestry in uh, Europe was different from the Iranian farmer ancestry in Iran and the farmer ancestry in Iran was more similar to the Caucasus hunter-gatherers. So yeah, this is something else to note here as well. They were not not Natufian derived like the Anatolian farmers but rather they were distinct and most likely resembled uh, uh, the uh, Caucasus hunter-gatherers. So firstly the first uh, evidence here is this PCA and in this PCA you can clearly see that ancient and modern Iranians cluster together. The early Iranian clusters with the Yagnobi peoples and the two ancient Iranian samples we have one from Tape Hassanlu and one from northwestern Iran from Haji Firuz and Achaemenid era median sample both cluster with contemporary Iranians and not with Nordic Europeans. This shows that there is a great deal of genetic continuity in Iran since the Iron Age and next up I'll just discuss the history and this hybridization and how it took fold. The Proto-Indo-Europeans were Nordic populations. They were the Androno, Sintashta and Strubnaya peoples and they were derived from the Yamnaya culture and the Corded Ware culture and these individuals were mostly Nordic. They were around 100% Nordic ancestry and these Nordic individuals were settled in the northern steppes of what is today Kazakhstan and they were 100% Nordic but what most scientists and scholars today fail to realize is that these Nordics later when they entered the BMAC horizon which was heavily populated by a very advanced and highly agriculturalized uh, farmers and uh, very settled peoples of the BMAC culture they mixed with them on impact and this is there's a great deal of evidence for this there's the recent studies that came out on this and there's also a lot of genetic evidence proving that this hybridization took place as with the early Iranians so the early Iranians were around 52% Androno and 47% BMAC derived and that's quite remarkable and shows that there was a great deal of admixture with the native population of the BMAC culture as well as the Androno steppe pastoralists. These steppe pastoralists later went on into Iran and had mixed with the native farmers of the Iranian cultures with the natives on impact and by the time of the Persian Empire they were already mixed as shown in the Persian friezes as well as in the Persian depictions of Persian arts of the ancient Persians and Medians and we have a Median sample and we have a Hurrian sample and both show great affinity to modern Iranians and not to Nordic Europeans so yeah this is just another evidence that the ancient Iranians were not Nordic Europeans and that the Proto-Indo-Iranians did mix with the peoples of the Bima culture and this mixture led to the formation of the modern Iranian groups we know today. So none of the ancient Eastern Iranics nor the uh, Western Iranics can be considered to be Nordic with the exception of the Scythians but they had minor East Asian, they had 20 to 50 percent East Asian ancestry and the Sarmatians. Both of those groups were Nordics but the remainder groups were not Nordics and did not ha and had significant BMAC uh, ancestry. These include the Khwarezmians, the Sogdians, the Bactrians, the Aryans, the Persians, the medians as well as the parthians oh wait kahan they're not anatolian or zagrosian farmers anymore they're european farmers europeans neolithic european farmers not that it makes that much of a difference anyways as the people of the balkans are pretty much still embedded and a Bronze Age farming culture. Anyhow, the Bronze Age refuses to end in this region of Europe. The proof, I mean, just look at how they 
genetically cluster in the exact same spot as the prehistoric Iron Age, Bronze Age settlers of this region of Europe. The same exact people have been living here for thousands of years, man. All the migrations have been insubstantial. Now, there's no shadow of a doubt that these ethnic Pactions eventually morphed into the people we refer to as ethnic Pashtuns and Patans in our current uh, political geography and terminology because all most Afghan tribes and ethnicities, be they Pashtun, Nuristani, or Tajik, do descend partially or derive like half of their ancestry from the BMAC horizon. They do have BMAC ancestry, and BMACized Iranians and non BMACized Iranians, like the Scythians and Sarmatians, are from two entirely different planets. Moreover, the Pashtuns correspond to the same region as that of the Pactions, like southern Afghanistan, Arachosia, the Suleiman Mountain region, which is the base which is basically the bedrock of where it's basically the Pashtun or Haimat, the original Pashtun homeland, and Afghan and Pashtun used to be synonyms of each other historically. A while ago, I published a video here entitled Proof of the Non-Slavic Ancestry of the South Slavs, and it was a bit controversial and standoffish. The South Slavs of the Balkans have a different genetic and ethnic history and are the outcome of the Slavic invaders who were able to impose their culture, language, and ethnic identity on the indigenous southeastern Europeans. The Ritzky of Eurogenes has done an excellent job at investigating this issue. Since most Europeans are oblivious to their history now, and archaeologists and geneticists discover new things all the time. So even though the South Slavs speak Slavic languages, they derive the vast majority of their ancestry from the pre-existing Balkan farmers and therefore cluster more closely towards the Mediterranean genetic profile. If you take a look at the Proto-Bulgars, who have commonly been considered to be a Turkic people, you see that they cluster fairly close to contemporary Bulgarians, and both are genetically closest to Southern Europeans, with the exception being that the contemporary Bulgarians are just slightly Slavic shifted. The Croats have a bit more step admixture than the Serbs do, but they're still largely Mediterranean as well. So, we have to reconsider the narrative behind the ethnic origins of the people here. If only because pan-Slavism has been a total failure in the Balkans. This video shouldn't have been so controversial and standoffish because I'm not the only one who says this. The original proto-Slavic people uh, existed a long time ago, but they do exist today in, in the form of modern Slavic speakers of, in here in Poland and the Russians the Belarusians and the Ukrainians, basically the Northern Slavs, uh, because they're genetically almost identical to the, the Proto-Slavic people, the Balto-Slavic people. Uh, the Southern Slavs from the Balkans uh, are actually, they're a bit different because uh, during the Middle Ages and the Huns, um, they left a power vacuum in the Balkans and that allowed the Northern Slavs to, uh, to impose their culture and language on the people in the Balkans from the 6th century onwards. 
and today the Serbs and Bosnians and what have you, they speak Slavic languages, but they have maybe about 20% uh, input from that Slavic uh, invasion. So the rest comes from indigenous Balkan farmer. Uh, so they're much more south shifted. They're mo more closely related in some ways to Greeks. So they're kind of like Greek Slavs mix in a way. Actually, I wouldn't classify Slavicized Illyrians as Greek Slavs. Once again, Pan-Slavism is a joke. I could say more, but this episode is way too long already, so I've decided to continue it in a second episode. And this is where I end my dissertation. Thank you for watching.